to uh, introduce you to him. He um, he's a geologist. He got his undergrad in geology here at the University of the Basque Country, but then um, to do his PhD, he decided to study hum human evolution at the Universidad de Burgos. After he finished his PhD, he moved to University of Cambridge for his postdoc, and later to the Museum, National Museum of Natural History. Let me get my... That's in Paris. So he's been traveling. Uh, he got a Maria, Marie Curie Research Fellowship for that. And since 2014, he works at the University of the Basque Country. He has been awarded the prestigious Iker Basque Research Fellowship, also the Ramon y Cajal Fellowship. Um, he is the member, a member of the Atapuerca Research Team since 2005, and uh, 2001. And since 2015, he is the coordinator of the Galeria de las Estatuas, one of the biggest, um, I guess you're, you're going to talk about the Galeria de las Estatuas, right? He'll tell you about it. It's quite huge. He's also the PI of the excavation and research of two additional sites, Bayo, which is in Cestoa, Guipúzcoa, and Polvorín Sima, which is in Carranza, in Vizcaya. His main research interest revolves around the evolution of the postcranium in the genus Homo, and more particularly on the evolution of the spine and the thorax. He's also interested in the behavioral and anatomical variation of Neanderthals and the first population and paleoecology of the Basque Country. The results of his research have made very important contributions uh, to the field of human evolution, as you will very uh, soon see. And like I said before, geologists have come in very handy to the biologists and geneticists these days because they have shown us that sedimentary rocks, which seem to be boring rocks, now have a lot of DNA that we can analyze and study ancient DNA without the need of fossils. And you can also see an example of that in the recent, in the recent Nature paper where they have analyzed the uh, ecosystem of Greenland of two million years ago, and you will see how interesting data they have gotten. But anyway, today we're going to talk about Neanderthals and what um, Asier has found in the uh, in La um, Galería de las Estatuas in Atapuerca. Thank you very much, Asier. Hello. Eguno angustio hoy. Es que ricasco con pida pena gatik. Thank you very much to to Ana Zubiaga and uh, Alicia Anshot for the kind invitation to be here. Um, as Ana did in her presentation, I'm a paleontologist, so I, I did my undergrad in geology because I was interested in in paleontology. Uh, and in fact. Um, um, when I was an undergrad student, I had the opportunity to go to the to the Atapuerca sites in, uh, to, to work there, and then I I had the opportunity to do my PhD in the both the middle Pleistocene fossil remains from Cima de los Huesos and also the lower Pleistocene remains from uh, Grandolina T D six level, which are 800,000 years old. Um, after that, I have been also doing a lot of work on Neanderthals, and this is a little bit of what I want to talk about today. So, um, beginning from the, from the end, um, I have like three main messages that I would like you to, to, to carry home, and is that a first study of ancient DNA is providing new insights into the evolution of Neanderthals, then the second one, so these are really general ideas, uh, in Galeria de las Estatuas, it has been possible to recover for the first time 
Neanderthal nuclear DNA before it was possible to, to recover um, mitochondrial DNA from other sites, but this was the first time it was, it was possible to, to recover both uh, mitochondrial and uh, nuclear DNA from sediments, which opens a, a, big, a big gate to, into new um, research. And then I also would like to underscore the, underscore the importance of collaboration between different uh, branches of sciences, uh, between bioscientists, paleontologists, geologists, and archaeologists, because uh, when you uh, excavate a site, uh, site you need to, to gather as much information as possible, because the excavation of uh, an archaeological or paleontological site is the control destruction of this site. So all the information that you don't uh, gather, you are losing it. So a little bit of information regarding Neanderthals, as you will probably know. Um, Neanderthals are a human group um, that we share a common ancestor with that is uh, positioned more or less about uh, one million years ago. That meaning that uh, we share, let's say, a grandfather or grandmother with them, and they are our evolutionary cousins. Uh, they were hunter-gatherers. Uh, their chronology spans between roughly 200,000 years ago to around 40,000 years ago, where uh, they became extinct. Uh, when you look at the anatomy of Neanderthals, there are um, some, it's a mixture between primitive and derived features. So for example, they have uh, really wide pelvis with a long, uh, long pubic, uh, um, pubic uh, bones, uh, large, large thoraces, and uh, long clavicles. These are uh, already primitive features that we can find in Homo erectus. But on the other side, we have other uh, some derived features that can be found in uh, different parts of the, of the anatomy of these, uh, of these uh, hominins, both in the head, in the teeth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, in fact, in, when we look in detail into the fine anatomy of uh, all the skeletal remains, we can find differences. Still, they are close related uh, hominins to us, so there, there might be a lot of uh, anatomic overlap, but there are distinct differences, even in the most, uh, in the smallest uh, bone of the skeleton, which is, this is the, the stay piece, which is one of the ear bones, the inner ear bones. Uh, here, this is a CT scan of a Neanderthal uh, temporal bone, the La Ferrazia 8 temporal bone. So we did a CT scan, and inside we were able to identify this stay piece. So we were able to do a, a 3D re, a reconstruction of this uh, bone, which is, you can see the size, it's a really, really tiny bone. And even in this tiny uh, and small bone, there are anatomical differences because this is the head in our species. We would have this head in the middle of the bone, and here is uh, more asymmetrical. So that said, um, we normally associate Neanderthals to, to living in cold environments, uh, and this, is, uh, this was the case. For example, uh, in Belgium, 45,000 years ago, with a sea level of uh, roughly 60 meters be uh, below what we have today, with mammoths, uh, Neanderthals preying on mammoths and reindeer. But also, which is less common, is that Neanderthals were inhabiting areas and chronologies in which uh, they had, uh, the climate was similar today. Uh, for example, 1,000 and 2,500,000 years ago in Croatia, in which the, the climate was similar to today, or uh, even when we look at the uh, geography of the Neanderthal um, uh, range of the living, they also lived in the, in the Middle East, and Neanderthals here were hunting gazelles. So here they were hunting mammoths, uh, red deer and um, other kind of uh, ungulates, uh, bisons, and here they were hunting gazelles, which is an, an animal which is normally related to warm climates. The importance of um, ancient DNA applied to the Neanderthal knowledge goes uh, 
quite a long time ago, already 15 years ago, it was possible to uh, study the mitochondrial DNA of a site which is in, in the southern part of Siberia. And in this case, human remains that uh, were not taxonom taxonomically di uh, diagnostic, like small fragments of long bones that were not, we knew that they belonged to a hominin, but it was not possible to ascribe either to uh, modern humans or Neanderthals were analyzed using ancient DNA, and it was possible to retrieve from their mitochondrial DNA. Uh, this positive identification of this uh, human group in this cave expanded nearly 2,000 kilometers the home range of Neanderthals that was normally, traditionally, uh, assigned to Europe and southwestern Asia. So this is the currently, more or less, it has been expanded a little bit more here with uh, more findings, but more or less the Neanderthal world. Um, when we talk about Neanderthals, they, were, uh, they had culture, but we can see um, that there are differences in both, uh, cultural differences in both chronologically and geographically. So rather than speaking about Neanderthal culture in singular, we should talk about Neanderthal cultures in plural. And um, just to give you a small example, I will talk about uh, mortuary practices. So it's the relationship of uh, Neanderthals with their dead. One of the possibilities was that Neanderthals, in a few cases, in most cases, we don't know what happened with the bones because they are just fragments. But in a few cases, we have found uh, partial to complete skeletons, in some cases, in, our, uh, in anatomical articulation. Uh, it, um, it is possible to find geological evidence of a fossa that was dug and they, they disposed of the body there. So there's evidence of burial. And the interesting thing is that this has a, a starting point. Uh, we, don't, we do not find burial uh, evidence before 125,000 years. And this is more or less the, the same time in which uh, other modern humans in the Levant were also starting to uh, bury their dead. But on the other hand, there are some other uh, sites in which uh, the Neanderthal remains are found broken with cut marks, broken because they bro uh, break the bone in order to extract the marrow and, and consume it, with cut marks uh, in order to deflesh, to take out the flesh and, and consume it, uh, the meat. And it's exactly the same treatment as we can find in the faunal remains. And this is evidence of cannibalism. So, in some cases, and even in a short period of time, in the closer related places, we can find both evidence of burials and evidence of cannibalism. So this is, this is something more interesting than rather finding one thing, because this talks about the cultural diversity of this human group. Another of the, the breakthroughs uh, regarding the, the Neanderthal study the, the, the study of the ancient DNA of Neanderthals was the, to find evidence that there was a, a mixture between Neanderthals and modern humans. At the beginning, with the study only of mitochondrial DNA, it was not possible to prove that. Uh, right now, I think that there's a general consensus that Neanderthals interbred with modern humans, the, with non-African uh, modern humans, uh, the question remains where and when exactly. And some of the, of the, um, of the additional proofs that have been found is, for example, uh, this modern human mandible, which is uh, uh, from the cave of Pestera Kuoase in Romania, which is around uh, 35 to 50, uh, sorry, 35 to 40,000 years old. It's one of the oldest fossils in uh, in, in the European fossil record. And in this case, the amount of Neanderthal DNA found in this mandible was a big, it was larger than what we can find in extant or in recent modern humans, which talks about a Neanderthal access ancestor between four to six generations back. Uh, furthermore, continuing with this uh, study of 
uh, fossil remains of human fossil remains that were not taxonomically di diagnostic, it was possible to retrieve first uh, mitochondrial DNA and then also nuclear DNA of a, of a, uh, a different lineage. At, the, at some point, uh, it, they are called, they are so called the Denisovans because the first evidence of this, of this uh, kind of DNA was found in the Denisova cave in, in Siberia. And the most recent uh, analysis showed that they share a, a, a common ancestor with Neanderthals around 400,000 uh, years ago. So we have one lineage that goes to Neanderthals, another lineage that goes to the Denisovans, and there has been also evidence of admixture between these two branches and also has been found in Denisova, or, uh, Denisova 11, would be um, one of the individuals that have a, uh, a mother that was a Neanderthal and a father that was a, a Denisovan. Still, we don't have nearly zero information, anatomical information about this, uh, these hominids. We know that they are more closely related to the Neanderthals, but uh, nothing else. And in this case, in the case of Denisova 11, uh, the, the strategy in order to, to obtain this kind of, uh, of molecular evidence was first to take a lot of undeterminate, uh, undeterminate uh, uh, bones. We didn't know that whether they were faunal remains or human remains. And first, uh, the prote uh, proteonymic analysis was done. Once uh, there was a positive match with a hominin uh, proteome, then uh, DNA analysis was done. So actually, this Denisova 11 is a tiny fragment of um, just an uh, indeterminate fragment that you cannot uh, retrieve any kind of anatomical information from there. And this is also important because this is just to squeeze as much information as possible from the fossil record that we have. Uh, the origin of Neanderthal, we have to find it in the, in the middle Pleistocene hominins. And in the middle Pleistocene, there's a, a lot, let's say, there's a lot of uh, morphological variation. Um, we have the famous uh, Mauer mandible, which is one of the oldest uh, hominin fossils in, the, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, a name was named after it, which is uh, Homo heidelbergensis, because it was found close to the uh, German city of Heidelberg. Which is the problem that this mandible resembles to nothing else. There's a slight resemblance to the mandible of Arago, but just a slight. So we cannot group all the other fossils within Homo heidelbergensis. So even if we have been talking about Homo heidelbergensis once and again for the Middle Pleistocene European fossil record, this is a more and more a name of a species that we don't use anymore. Within all this variation, the first true evidence of uh, derived characteristic of Neanderthals, we can find it in, a, in the Sima de los Huesos specimens. This is the, the famous uh, Cranium 5, which has associated the, the cervical remains and has a, the, par, the part of the mastoc, masticatory apparatus, the, the, the mandible morphology, both the teeth and then the part of the, of the maxillae. This morphology is al already uh, derived in a Neanderthal sense. However, uh, the cranial vault is still primitive. So Sima de los Huesos is, is a, a, key, a key place in order to understand the origin of Neanderthals. This is a, a really tiny place within the Sierra de Atapuerca. Uh, it's a difficult, a difficult access. You have to go down 14 meters. Uh, below the, the place is really small. Uh, there's lack of oxygen. So normally, each of the field systems, you have to go with, a, with a, a oxygen a bottles and open it, because if not, you can be uh, in danger of having uh, problems, uh, respiratory problems. Um, and this is the largest accumulation by far of uh, fossil hominins in, in Europe and in the world. So right now there's more than 7,000 human remains that have been recovered from there, belonging to 29 individuals from both sexes and different ages at death. Uh, different ages at death, but surprisingly, uh, it is not what we would expect in the other uh, let's say, for example, more recent Neanderthal 
uh, Neanderthal fossil record. Normally, in Neanderthal fossil record, we have more really young specimens and really old specimens, which are the most likely to die. Here, what we have is mostly uh, adolescents and uh, young adults. And then there's evidence, for example, in this cranium, cranium 17, of a perimortem, um, uh, perimortem uh, fractures that were probably, are, we interpret, interpret them as a symbol of, of violence within the group. Um, and then the important thing is that here you can see some of uh, mo the most complete uh, cranial remains. And uh, the next step is that we are now associating fossils to one another. So we are still, we are now in the process of st start having partial skeletons, uh, which multiply the information, of course. So one of the feats that was uh, really, really important was to obtain uh, first, mitochondrial DNA and then nuclear DNA from such old fossil remains. Uh, remember that we are talking about 430,000 years ago. So this is, and, and then this is not Siberia, this is not a permafrost. This is a, a cave, a well protected cave in Burgos, which is a guarantee of uh, good preservation in cold, but it's uh, in a lower latitude than we, we would expect. So this is the femur 12. It's a, a femur from the right side, and um, it was drilled in order to extract to, to, uh, to extract uh, mitochondrial DNA. And the, the big surprise here was that uh, even if the morphology of the semi-los huesos remains uh, are uh, or have the, the first evidence of, of Neanderthals, what we what, uh, what we found here was that uh, the the mitochondrial nearly complete uh, mitochondrial genome was more related to, to Denisovans. So looking at the mitochondrial uh, genome, the semi-los huesos were related to, to Denisovans. The next step was, of course, uh, to retrieve um, nuclear DNA from, from the same individuals and also from some other teeth. And in this case, uh, it was clear that semi-los huesos were related to, to Neanderthals rather than to the Nisovans, looking at the Neanderthal, sorry, uh, looking at the nuclear DNA. But also the consequence was that at some point in the Neanderthal lineage that started with a Denisovan like mitochondrial genome, the Neanderthal genome appeared somehow, probably from Africa, probably. Uh, related also to uh, some cultural changes that can be found between around 250, 300,000 years ago with the appearance of the first evidence of Middle Paleolithic. But this is just a working hypothesis. Um, as I said before, Neanderthals, um, went extinct, apart from the admixture, but went extinct around 42 to 40,000 years ago. Um, there are not that many directly dated fossil remains, Neanderthal fossil remains. There are a couple of them in France uh, related to a very interesting uh, uh, transitional uh, lithic uh, remains. The, and some others in, in Belgium. And we also have to remember that in, in Europe, the most, the oldest evidence of uh, Homo sapiens comes from um, the site of uh, Bachokiro uh, in Bulgaria and has uh, uh, 45,000 years ago. So there's an overlap of around 3,000 years uh, in which these two hominin groups were in Europe. Uh, what we don't know is whether they were closely related because we are talking about uh, Neanderthals that are dated in Belgium and France and the other are in Bulgaria. So the end of Neanderthals is not that straightforward. It's not just a period in which they disappear and, and that's it. Uh, the very last Neanderthals uh, also show kind of cultural change. There are uh, different uh, lithic cultures that appear which are normally called uh, transitional cultures, it has been debated whether or not they are related to 
uh, exchange of ideas with Homo sapiens. And one of the cases that uh, pertain to the uh, Iberian Peninsula would be the Chatel Perronian. So the, we have around between 43 to 40,000 years ago another um, uh, lithic culture, which is the, the Chatel Perronian. And the interesting fact is that when we look at the lithics, because they are more, more, more common than human remains, and we look at the Neanderthal occupations in the Iberian Peninsula, and we look at the end at the, of the traditional, let's say, uh, lithic remains, the Musterian, and then the first evidence of Chatel Perronian, there's a, a, what in French is called uh, decalage. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's no overlapping there. So one of the proposals is that, of course, first, we, don't, we do not have that many sites that could be a bias, but another possibility would be that there would be a partial extinction of Neanderthals in the Iberian Peninsula with that kind of uh, material culture, and then some other groups from the southern part of France with this other uh, uh, culture came into, into appearance before the final extinction of this group. And this is something that also has been proposed, not exactly the same thing, but also some kind of uh, populational turnovers or partial turnovers at the end of the Neanderthal uh, history during a marine isotope uh, three stage, but before, before the, or predating the arrival of anatomically modern humans. There's a low, uh, there's a, a low, so Neanderthals lose some uh, let's say, uh, genetic variation there. So, what we have seen is that first, uh, as um, Anna uh, commented in her uh, general introduction, fossil remains are really rare. You can be uh, excavating for uh, years and years and not finding anyone. So, a breakthrough was to try to find uh, mitochondrial DNA from, from sediments, and this is an, a really interesting article about uh, Vivian Sloan and, and other collaborators in which they try to look for mitochondrial DNA from sediments in different caves, in, both in Europe and in uh, Asia. And what, we what they found was that they found a Neanderthal DNA, a but also the Nisoban DNA. So this is uh, the problem with the Nisoba cave, the problem, and also one of the importance, is that in the Nisova cave, you can find Neanderthal remains and also the Denisovan remains, which makes it more difficult to address some of the discussions. So here you have a lot of uh, the Neanderthal DNA from the Nisova cave, which is related to the Neanderthals, and then you have here another uh, Neanderthal, sorry, uh, the Nisovan uh, mitochondrial DNA, which is related to the Nisovans. Okay, so this is the first part, just a general introduction. So now I'm going to move a little bit back to uh, the Sierra de Tapuerca in uh, 2007. So Sierra de Tapuerca is, is a, an archaeopaleontological complex, which is well known, uh, and has more than one million years of, uh, of a stratigraphic and archaeopaleontological record. So there are sites like uh, the Mirador, Portalón, which have a Holocene uh, chronology, which is uh, less than uh, 10,000, roughly 10,000 years ago. Interestingly, here in Mirador, there are modern human remains of Bronze Age chronology, which also show cannibalism remains. Um, also, there's a, a, a huge collection of human remains from the Middle Pleistocene in Cima de los Huesos, but also we have some hunting activities recorded in both Galeria and also a level TDD 10 from, uh, uh, from Grandolina. And of course, uh, more and more records are being breaking, broken, sorry, uh, because this was uh, the first page of nature when the 1.2 million years old uh, mandible was found in 2007, but uh, maybe you remember that uh, this July, during the field season, a new face was found, uh, also an elefante, which is uh, 200,000 years older. We have to remember that in 1994, the oldest fossil remain in Europe was published, uh, was a tibia from Boxgrove in the UK, and was uh, 500,000 uh, years old. So now we are talking about 1.5 million years old of occupation in Europe. This is a huge, a huge 
success in trying to understand the complex, uh, the complex um, inhabitation of, of, of Europe during a, a long period of time. However, there's a gap. Uh, there's not much upper place to send a fossil record in caves. In the open air areas around the, uh, the Sierra, uh, some Neanderthal tool remains have been found, but there was no, no, no uh, upper place to send uh, records in caves. So, because we have done some geological work before, we knew that uh, here in Galeria de las Estatuas, which is, this is the, the Atapuerca, the cave system, so this is the actual entrance. You have the big cave, which is called uh, El Portalón. Then you have a gallery. Uh, here there is a, what we call a trifurcación, because one of them goes to Galería de las Estatuas, another one goes to the back part of Elefante, and then another one goes to Cima de los Huesos. So here, when you arrive here, uh, what you, you find is just a, a pile of sediment and a spill of them. You can no, not go farther. If we excavated here, <laughs> we would go outside the, the cave. So this is, was potentially one of the entrances to the cave system during the upper Pleistocene. So the idea was, okay, let's, let's test whether or not here there are upper Pleistocene sediments. So what we did was to break um, the spill of them, start excavating, and uh, voila, a Neanderthal tool, tool a flint tool. So this, uh, when you talk with, uh, with archaeologists, uh, some of the uh, lithic tools, the, the stone tools that are used during human evolution have particular morphology. And in some cases, it is possible to ascribe them to different cultures. And this was uh, typical Musterian, typical of the Middle Paleolithic made by Neanderthals. So the next year, we ex continued excavating there. Uh, we opened a new uh, pit closer to the entrance, and then we enlarged the pit, and we have been excavating there. And actually, well, these are more pictures of the excavation, now a little bit slower because of the COVID, and we ex excavated also outside. So we have two test pits, one of them six meters, square, uh, square meters, sorry, and the other one around nine square meters, with a, a around so far, two meters, two meters of stratigraphy with uh, five different levels. This is a flowstone. This is um, a calcium carbonate that, uh, that um, crystallizes on top of the, on, on the floor. And then we have a datation here in the base of the spill, I think, which is 55,000 years old. That means the, the whole sequence is at least 55,000 years. Then we used uh, optically stimulated luminescence uh, dating methods in order to date this, and we have mainly two, two clusters, one of them around 80,000, and then another one around 105, 115,000 years old. What we have, have we found here? We have some fossil remains, mainly deer and horses, also some bison remains, and in the case of the, the uh, equids, uh, one of them, this is the Equisidontinus, it was possible to ascribe to, to this species uh, using a mitochondrial DNA, because there is a, a clear deletion in the, in the mitochondrial genome of, of this species, of the, the bones, some of the bones here. And this is uh, it's related to the onager, which is a, it's a wild ass that currently lives in the, in the Central Asia, but uh, in the places and also lived in, in Europe. We also find some carnivore remains and stone tools that are typical of Neanderthals. Human remains, yes, we have found only two of them. As I have said, I have, we have been working there for more than 14 years, and we found in 2017, in the sediment that was uh, cleaned in the river, a really a small uh, distal phalanx from the fifth ray. This is the, the pinky toe, the, the smallest uh, uh, bone from the, um, from the foot. And then this last year, in, in July, we also found uh, an upper molar. Uh, when we look at the, the morphology here, there's evidence of the use of toothpick in order to clean the, the teeth inside. So there's a, a particular grooves there by the use of uh, toothpicks uh, there. 
uh, we did analyze metrically and morphologically the pinky toe, and it's within the Neanderthal variation. This is just a simple, a simple uh, bivariate plot, uh, looking at uh, the articular length here and the height of the diaphysis, and these are Neanderthals. These are the, uh, well, this is a little bit of um, overlapping with modern humans, but um, morphologically is a Neanderthal a fossil remain. So, what about DNA preservation? Uh, would be some DNA preserved in, in, that, in that cave or not. So here, we did a, a two phases uh, sampling approach. The first one was to take a large amount of, of sediment. Uh, so it was a bulk uh, sampling, and we sent it to, 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 uh, to Germany, to the Max Planck Institute, in order to see whether or not there was DNA preserved and which species were preserved there. We had a bit of a surprise. So we on, not only found a human DNA there, but also DNA of bears and rhinos. Why bears and rhinos are important? Because at that very moment, we didn't have any uh, bone remain of uh, birds or rhinos. We found that same field season, like a couple of weeks later, we found some fossil remains from there. And then the second phase was to a detailed uh, sampling, which consisted on uh, several samples per level at different uh, heights, and also moving them in different parts of the, of the, um, of the stratigraphic level. So at the very end, we had like 48 samples in the pit one. You can see here, so for example, we also sampled even the, uh, um, the speleothem. So you have different samples at the same height, but also different samples at different heights within the same level. And the same thing was done in, in pit two, where we took less uh, amount because the preservation was not that good. Okay, so here, the, the, the big surprise was that the amount of the DNA preserved in the sediments was huge, was even larger than what we can, found, we can find in Siberia. So this is just uh, the length of the, of the bar indicates the, the age, and then the amount of the, the bars indicates the number of samples that were tested positive. So just as a comparative sample, we have a very, very old uh, information from Simaelos huesos, which comes from skeletal remains, but from Himaelos and Galielas statues, we also have a lot of information coming from the sediments. Okay, so again, the idea was first, let's look at the mitochondrial DNA, and then let's look at nuclear DNA. In the case of mitochondrial DNA, there were two, um, there were two, two things that were important. The first part is that uh, the samples that were higher in the stratigraphic sequence uh, were clustered with more recent uh, Neanderthal remains. However, the uh, samples that were lower, like older, were uh, clustered with another uh, more, let's say, basal uh, mitochondrial DNA from a uh, German site called Hollenstein Stadel. But additionally, uh, so this is, this is a kind of um, correlation between the different samples taken, all those points, points that I showed you earlier. And this is the correlation with uh, the different uh, mitochondrial DNAs of, uh, of other individuals and also those uh, that were best preserved from, uh, from the statues and other uh, sites from Siberia that were tested at the same time. And we see two, the second thing is that the oldest part so there's like a break around 110,000 years old in which the amount of mitochondrial DNA or let's say the, the, the kind of genome changes. There's more variation in the oldest one and then dramatically changes here. The, the, the question was, is this a bias due to sampling or this is something that we can see also in the nuclear DNA? So. Uh, it was also possible to, to do a phylogenetic analysis of the, uh, uh, of the nuclear DNA, 
And we can find that there's also two clusters. So the oldest one also uh, clusters with the, other, with the older ones. And then the most recent from different layers group more or less with more, uh, more recent uh, groups. And there's also a second part is that uh, doing a phylogenetic analysis, it was possible to propose two events of Neanderthal radiations. So one of them would be around 135,000, another one around 105,000. So there's a, some Neanderthal populations that were living in statuas 110,000 years ago, and at some point these populations, sorry, changes, and there's another population living there in the same cave slightly later on uh, in these uh, chronologies. Well, looking at the, at the nuclear DNA, uh, looking at the proportion between the X chromosome and the, the autosomes, it was also possible to try to infer the, the sex uh, of, uh, of some of the, of the samples that also for which also we had a mitochondrial DNA. And it was possible to see that uh, there were three female individuals and one male in the, on the older layers. So this is, this is a, a work that was published in Science last year. and uh, was um, the, the senior authors are uh, Benjamin Bernot and, uh, and then Matthias Meyer. And I, I have been talking a little bit about the, the results that we obtained because, as I said, uh, for good or for bad, I am a, uh, paleontologists working in human remains and not that much in molecular, in molecular uh, paleontology, let's say. Uh, but I would like uh, to recommend you because they have some really interesting talks, uh, both Benjamin and also Vivian Sloan, which is the, uh, another researcher who has been doing a lot of work in sediment DNA. So just, if you just type that in YouTube, you will find uh, really interesting talks there. So what now? Well, well, as I said, we have a two meter uh, sequence, but in that two meter sequence, uh, we still haven't uh, arrived to the cave floor. So there's still more sediment there. So ideally, we should still excavate there, try to find more human occupations, and uh, if we hit the jackpot, maybe trying to find in new uh, Neanderthal DNA, and Neanderthal fossil would be even better, but Neanderthal DNA that would be uh, older than 110,000 years old. And of course, more fossils and more sites uh, are needed in order to, to, to gain more insights in, into, into these questions. So just to, to, to end again with the main ideas that I would like you to, to express is that, uh, as I have, have tried to, to, to convince you that all the new insights that uh, the ancient DNA is providing regarding the evolution of Neanderthals, and the Galeria de las Estatuas, which is not maybe as known as Cima de los Huesos or Grandolina in, uh, in Sierra de Atapuerca, is also becoming one of the key sites in order to study the Neanderthal population dynamics during the late Pleistocene. And of course, this kind of works is only possible between, in, because there's a, a collaboration which is completely transdisciplinary that goes across disciplines. So uh, different, like uh, geology, geochronology, paleontology, and of course, bioscientists. So I would like uh, to, to thank my fellow colleagues from both the, from the Status Excavation and Research Team and also the, the Max Plan Research, Research Group. And also thank you all for, for your attention. Thank you, Asier, for this very interesting talk. The questions for Asier? Who's first? I have a question. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure if I understood well. I think that you mentioned that in the case of the Denisovans, at the beginning, people were studying the proteomes, and if they found signs of uh, the, the, the human remains, uh, then they went for the DNA. Is that so? And so, uh, are you applying protein-based studies to, because proteins in principle can be preserved better in the fossil record at least, uh, yeah, they're less easily degraded than DNA. So what about these approaches? Or 
you don't find enough material to go for a proteomic analysis. Can you comment about that? Yes, no, this, that's, that's a great question. Um, so, um, ideally, I, the, the problem with, with the proteome is that it doesn't provide as an accurate picture as the DNA. So, it's a, if, I, if I am not mistaken, at, at this point, with uh, the proteome, you can, you can distinguish between hominin remains and then maybe some other general mammal groups, but you cannot uh, obtain like, precise or more precise information regarding the evolution of Neanderthals. So, um, the proteomic analysis has been, has, has been used in even older sites, for example, in, uh, in the Caucasus, in, in Manisi, in, in, in the site of Manisi, which has uh, 1.8 million years, in order to establish the, the phylogenetic relationship between the Stephanorhinus etruscus, which is a rhinoceros, and then extant rhinoceroses, which are far beyond what can be done with uh, with a DNA analysis for those latitudes. So, um, yes, uh, the thing is that also the, the protein an analysis is cheaper. So, if I am not mistaken, they were, uh, they were looking at just, um, because uh, Denisova has been a, a place of occupation, but also has been occupied by, by hyenas. So, some of the, of the bone remains can be uh, carried by hyenas, and also they preyed on human remains, as, as we know. So. In this case, they did like 2,000 analyses of uh, protein analysis, which are cheaper. And then in those that were the hominin remains, oh, sorry, hominin uh, signal was found, then applied the, the the DNA. But I think it's it's a combined strategy. So they they look where to look in older sediments. You, you look for that, and it, and in fact, this is something that has been done also in TD6, which is 800,000 years old. Um, there's no, because of the, of the conditions of the sediment there, right now there's no methodologically, it's not feasible to do, to do a DNA retrieval there. So who knows in the future, but. Hello, um, great talk and sorry my English. <laughs> uh, I want to know your opinion about a question. Um, taking into account the uh, usual interbreeding between the Nisoba, Neanderthal, Homo sapiens, uh, why do we still consider them as different species and not uh, as a single species? Thank you. Well, I. Um I will give you my, my opinion. And the thing is that uh, nature and reality are uh, more complex. And we, when we try to, when we, we, we talk about uh, different things, we try to, to push them into drawers, different drawers, because they have differences. So for me, as a paleontologist, the morphological differences that we find in Neanderthals are enough in order to, to do like separate species by name, because then we know that uh, there, there is interbreeding. But we also know that there is interbreeding in, in extant species of, um, of a, a lot of different birds, and there's uh, like a hybrids there, and there's no problem in saying, okay, we know which is the, the, the variation, which know, we know what is the, the diversity there. Uh, what would change? At the very end, we could, we could still name them, I don't know, uh, Homo sapiens and Andertalensis, but we would still name them somehow. And then there's, there's something that is uh, Neanderthals separated uh, uh, one million years ago. There's, as I say, there's uh, clear morphological differences in most cases. The problem is that in some cases when we do not know what a bone is, we, don't, we do not say homo sp in rare cases. And we, we try just to, to say, this is a Neanderthal, this is a modern human, and this is probably the error. But this is, I think it's, it's a kind of approach. Uh, I mean, uh, at the very end, for me, names are tools in order to comprehend the, the, the complexity of nature. 
And we, we have to, to have in mind this approach to names also, that they are tools and not uh, invariant uh, things. So whether we know that there's interpreting, uh, depending on what kind of uh, definition you use, I use the paleontological definition because I am a paleontologist. Because of course, the general biological definition is uh, different, but we also know that, and there's people here that know more about that than me, that uh, then nature is more complex. So this is my approach, at least. Questions. Can, can you comment a little bit on this uh, when you showed us uh, the, these two Neanderthal populations, one 135,000 years ago and 105? Is there anything um, that may suggest what, what happened there? Uh, okay, so what we, we commented that on the paper because there's a huge climate variations at that moment. So here, uh, sorry, oops. Here, around 125,000 years ago, there's a uh, climatic optimum, which is similar to, to the climate optimum that was uh, is, um, currently. Uh, and in, in this moment, uh, it was a colder climate. So one, the, one of the possibilities would be that because the northern part of Europe becomes, uh, it is not possible to inhabit there because of the, of the, of the freezing conditions, like the really cold climates. The different Neanderthal populations are more concentrated in the southern uh, European peninsulas. And somehow there's a kind of a genetic drift there, kind of, uh, and then, and this is something that has been proposed for different species, whether there is a, a different refugia or not. But still, the short answer would be, uh, we don't know. And these are like different scenarios that we need more fossils and we need more, uh, more accurate datings in order to, to test for, for those. But still, that's the problem, is that the most likely places in order to have Neanderthal fossil remains are the southern peninsulas, uh, the, the Balkanic Peninsula, uh, the Italic Peninsula, of course, uh, the Iberian Peninsula. But these are because of the latitude and the warmer climate. The, places in which potentially there's less probability of uh, DNA preservation, so. And when you analyze, now that we have quite a lot of remains, Neanderthal remains, when you analyze the really old remains and, um, and newer remains, do, do you start to see like the, the genetic variation is lowering, which may suggest why they disappeared? Why they disappeared? Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's uh, no because that would be to look in the really late Neanderthals between mm -hmm. 60 and 40,000. And for that, there are not so many individuals. The thing is that when you look at the overall fossil record, which is mostly composed of isolated tooth remains and maybe small phalanges or something, it's like 500, 600 individuals for a huge uh, geography and for a really 200,000 uh, years of uh, chronology. Um, for that period, it is not possible because we still don't have a good grasp of the whole variation there. So for example, for San Antonio regions, even if it is the, the most and the best studied fossil human, we still don't, we don't know much about, for example, the, um, the I studied the vertebral column. The vertebral column of female Neanderthal is not is basically unknown. There's no preservation of that, so we still don't have a good. When when you look at the bigger picture, so the process between Simaelos huesos and then the 200 years old Neanderthal, you can see some processes of uh, an accumulation of more and more Neanderthal derived features. But in the short scheme, I think that the the DNA is what giving us more information about these partial turnovers or complete turnovers and all, also looking also at the at cultural evidence. So this is why we cannot um, uh, look uh, away from any kind of evidence that we have. We have to look at everything. We have to talk to the archaeologists. We have to talk to, the, to everybody mm -hmm. in order to, to, to get as much information as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More questions for us here? Anyone around here? Yeah, there's a question there. Uh, 
Um, first of all, thank you for your presentation, Professor. It was very enlightening, indeed. I have to say that. And I have a, a question that includes more like the anthropological cultural landscape, because I noticed that you emphasize this characteristic. So I want to grab it again and ask the question in that direction. So you mentioned that you found signs of cannibalism, and you use this as a cultural sign to distinguish in between the different cultural groups in Neanderthals? That's what I understood. Yes. Well, this is, this is that uh, what we can say is that in most cases, so most cases, like 90% uh, of the cases, we don't know what happens, how they treat their death. This is like, this is the first part. And then in the cases of what we do, we do know, that in some cases they bury, they do a hole and they put there, and in some other cases there's evidence of cannibalism. So there's uh, some, let's say, in some cases they treat the death with respect, and in some other cases they do not have any kind of problem of uh, taking advantage of a dead individual or killing them in order to, to, to do the so. But this is exactly the same that we can find in our own species. As I I mean, all hominid species use this feature? No, not, no. not all hominid species, no. Okay. No, the thing is that, for example, burial appears for the first time around 100,000 years ago in both Neanderthals and modern humans. There's some kind of proto-burials. One of them would be Simaelos huesos. There's a lot to talk about the, the Simaelos huesos accumulation, but some of them, in that case, would be an intentional accumulation of bodies but they were just thrown into a hole. It was not a, a purposeful burial. This is something that appears at some point in the, in the, in the, in the human um, history. And interestingly enough, in two different lineages that are closely related. And also, this is something that also provides us with a more fossil remains, because when they bury their dead, it is more easily preserved into the, the sedimentary fossil record. So this is, this is something that has history. I mean, fossil, fossil hominins are not, uh, are not apart from history. They have history, they have cultures that change. And in some cases, you have a bio biological group that has multiple cultures. But this is not surprising, because you can see the same thing in chimpanzees. So. I don't know if I am answering your question, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to specify it more then. Um, okay. So this, like this cannibalism feature was only used or appeared only in Neanderthal groups, but not in all the Neanderthal groups, just in some of them, like these burial things. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, this is, this is the thing. The thing is that in most cases, we don't know. And in some cases, burials, and in some other cases, cannibalism. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so thank you for your lecture. And related to what he has said, could it have been that um, um, some of the Neanderthal uh, populations that uh, practiced the, um, the cannibalism, could it have been more like a circumstantial or um, survival feature? Like um, because of the scarcity of the, of, uh, the gathering of that moment of, of the um, of what we, they had um, gathered, or the um, animals they had uh, killed, or in order to, to eat them, could it have been more like a circumstantial uh, feature that cannibalism uh, found in some Neanderthal populations? In some cases, it could be. In most cases, we don't know that. It is it's probably it's not possible to know that. What we do know is that, for example, when you compare uh, some uh, stress features in Neanderthals compared to the Middle Pleistocene hominids, like Simaelos huesos, Neanderthals look more stressed, so they have more uh, hypoplasias in the, in the NML, which uh, shows like they are more stressed, more uh, stressed, so they probably were pushing the limits of the ecosystems in which they were inhabited, inhabiting. In some cases, probably they were living fine, in some other cases, they were living more to the limit. Um, the, um, Population dynam dynamics in Neanderthals is not well known because most of the sites are beyond the car uh, radiocarbon um, limit. So it's difficult to date whether it's a short occupation, a long occupation. Um, so in, in general, it is difficult. It is not, it is not impossible. But um, 
just in order to, to answer something maybe not completely related, there are some, some evidences that, for example, in the case of Goyet, they were hunting deer, they were hunting uh, bisons, they were hunting horses. Uh, in the case, for example, in older hominins, so the first evidence of cannibalism is found in, uh, in, in, in Atapuerca also, in the Grandolina site, and they were hunting all kinds of animals. So it is not, uh, it could be related to necessity, but it is not uh, necessarily the case. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I have a question because I learned in class, uh, and I don't know this how this is, uh, that a uh, hominin species was discovered in Atapuerca, uh, the Omonte Cesar could be. And my question was related that these species did coincide uh, in time, or coincided in time with uh, the Neanderthals, and did they interbreed, or maybe with more human, uh, modern species, or more primitive humans, I mean? Well, in the case of Homo antecessor, so we have, just to give you a picture of the different human species that we, we have, an undetermined Homo species at 1.4 million years, another uh, fossil remains of 1.2 million years, then we have the 800,000 years old uh, Homo antecessor. Homo antecessor was, was first described as the common ancestor of uh, Neanderthals and modern humans. The thing is that there are some particular features in the dental remains that uh, look more towards that they were already into the Neanderthal lineage, over a lineage, not, not proper one, but Already they were not. This is the most accurate information that we have from their last common ancestor. So, in, as, as I said before, in the Middle Pleistocene, there's a lot of uh, diversity, morphological diversity. Probably this is also a reflection of uh, a lot of um, genetic va uh, variation, but the problem is that we, don't ha we do not have that information because uh, sites like Cima de los Huesos with such a good preservation are unique and that's a problem. So the thing is that when we look at different species, we see that admixture is more common. It's uh, not only in humans. So in humans, is, you have Neanderthals with Denisovans with, uh, uh, with modern humans. Uh, in the case of uh, cave bears, you have cave bears interbreeding with, um, with brown bears. And then there are different uh, separate species of cave bears that probably were interbreeding to, for one another. Uh, so this is something that we see in the, in the late Pleistocene. Probably the same thing was happening in the middle Pleistocene. The problem is that we do not know. We only, only have the scarce fossil remains. Uh, but I don't know if I am, I am just drift away from your question or it's okay. Or... Okay, I think we should stop here. You answered lots of questions, and I think that things got a lot clearer than before. <laughs> so um, we should stop here. Um, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to have this online seminar next week, probably next Wednesday. I'll send you information about that as soon as I figure out how to do that. And, um, and then I will also let you know when, when, where you can get your credit and your uh, attendance certificate and so on, OK? I'll keep you posted. So with that, I think that uh, we should give a big round of applause to the, uh, to the uh, guest uh, speakers now. Thank you very much. We can certainly say that they were great talks that we learned a lot, and I hope that uh, they can come over sometime soon and tell us more about what they're doing. Thank you very much.